I'm calling the meeting to order. The first item on there on the agenda is uh, that the FOIA statement, and this is something that I always state. Um, School District 5 of Lexington and Richland counties has complied with the requirements of the South Carolina Freedom of Information Act in notifying media and the public of this afternoon's meeting. The agenda has not been amended during the 24-hour uh, period notice period preceding. The agenda can be amended by two-thirds vote of the committee, but the district will take no substantive action on added items at this meeting. This is a committee of the whole to advise the full board no votes of substantive action or any substantive action will be taken at this meeting. Okay, the first item, first of all, Ms. Gardner is on the way and she said that, um, that she was running about five minutes late. Um, Ms. Huddle has joined us from uh, live and uh, from Clemson and, and, uh, and I guess I guess a Zoom meeting or, or, or one of those, I don't know the names of the, Google Meet, okay, Google Meet. So I've been corrected. Okay, um, first item is approval of the agenda. Ms. Huddle. Yes, um, I move that we approve the agenda with um, two adjustments. The first is that the approval of the minutes actually needs to be for the May 4th 2022 meeting, um, the minutes that were sent out were correct. It's it's just they were dated May 4th. And the other adjustment is to replace item 5B, uh, which did read Irmo High School East Wing additions cost analysis with um, discussion of the bond question. Okay. Um, so I, I second that since I'm the only one in the room here. So I second that. Okay, all in favor. And we have a vote here. It's unanimous of the two of us here. Okay. Um, the uh, I, I wanted to say that I'm the one that made the mistake on the on the um, minutes I put in April 4th instead of May 4th, but the minutes are correct in their the proper minutes from the proper meeting, but I put the wrong date on there. Okay, so I'm, I apologize. All right, um, item number next is the approval of the minutes of the May 4th, 2022 meeting. Do I hear a motion? I move that we appro approve the minutes of the May 4th, 2022 meeting. Oh, okay, I second, all in favor. So it's unanimous, there's <laughs> two of us here. Okay, um, that um, is out of the, the, those things, those shop talk is out of the way. Now we can move on to, uh, to the items on the agenda. The first item is um, agenda item five, discussion with administration. Item A, safety and security additions to the potential bond referendum projects. And Dr. Ross, um, I have some information um, and I would like to distribute it to you, if you don't mind. Um, Ms. Huddle, what I have here is uh, from the MBCon report, I have the, the, the buildings that, that belong to the district that had uh, a vestibules um, that, that we needed to work on in, in relationship to vestibules, cameras, security items and fencing and fire alarms. Those are the categories from the MBCon report. And what I did was simply list down from their list the, uh, the schools or the buildings that, that we needed to um, work on each of those items. So what we have is the projects with the, uh, where we needed vestibules, where we needed cameras, where we needed security items, where we needed fencing and we need fire alarm. That's from the MBCon report. So I'll read these schools to you so that you will have, I know you won't write all this down, but anyway, it's, it's here so that you'll know what we're talking about. Okay, vestibules, they noted that we needed uh, Dutch Fork Elementary School, Lee Park, um, Chapin Intermediate, Dutch Fork Middle School, Dutch Fork High School, Academy for uh, Success, uh, uh, Seven Oaks Elementary School and Irmo High School. Okay, um, the areas that we needed cameras at that time, they noted um, Ballantyne Elementary School, Dutch Fork Elementary School, H.E. Corley Elementary School, 
Harbison West Elementary School, Irmo Elementary School, Lake Murray Elementary School, um, uh, Lee Part Elementary School, uh, Nursery Road Elementary School, River Springs Elementary School, um, uh, Crossroads Intermediate School, Chapin Middle School, um, Dutch Fork Middle School, Irmo Middle School, Dutch Fork High School, and Spring Hill High School. So all of those project, all of those schools needed cameras, security system upgrades, and I think this is probably from 2019, and that may be that may may be <laughs> version 2.0. We might be at version 2.3 by now, but anyway, security systems. They listed Dutch Fork Elementary School, Nursery Road Elementary School, Crossroads Intermediate School, Dutch Fork High School, and Irmo High School. All right, fencing, this is to do with, with perimeter fencing and so forth. The ones that they had were Dutch Fork Elementary School, uh, Seven Oaks Elementary School, Irmo Elementary School, um, OPES, and um, um, Chapin, uh, excuse me, Chapin Intermediate School. Fire alarms, um, they had uh, Harbison West Elementary School, Oak Point Elementary School, and, and Irmo High School. So as you can see, there's a, a, a right um, ubiquitous list here. I don't think, I think there's more, more schools that don't, than, uh, that need work, that don't need, than don't need work. So. Anyway, having said that, that came directly out of the MB Con report. I'm not certain, and I'm, I don't not, and I asked this one time before, what projects that we had accomplished with our, with our basically 10 to, uh, which was back then $10 million annual maintenance uh, budget, which has been updated since then to I think 12 and a half million. But anyway, which projects we had that we'd actually accomplished off of that list, and and it wasn't and it wasn't a lot. Okay, it wasn't a lot. So, anyway, the reason I brought this forth was because that when we talk about a potential bond referendum, we need to uh, get me started. That's the list, but but um, we we need to discuss vis-a-vis -vis starting out, I guess the starting point of all this would be the MBCon report, and then, and then of course, in my view, that you, you know the administration kind of needs to uh, to update that, you know, to the present conditions. Like I said, that I don't know whether security in 2019 is equal to security in 2022. I doubt. I, I think there are new there are new outcomes that that we hadn't thought of back then. Is what I'm trying to say. But anyway, Dr. Ross, uh, having said all that, I wanted to hand the floor to you. All right. <clears throat> Thank you so much for this. And as I said, we, we always start from one point. That MBCon was uh, a, a great starting point, I think, in terms of cameras and security systems, um, fire alarms. Those are things that we should uh, look to take care of in our operational budget and, and our capital budget. Also, um, and, and you recommended that we reach out to SLED to look at uh, having law enforcement to walk our facilities with our architect and give us recommendations, especially after we learn lessons, uh, specifically after Uvalde. So we did that. We had um, a special agent from the uh, FBI who was um, uh, certified in um, uh, active shooter um, uh, training. Uh, to walk with our facilities team, with our, uh, with an architect, and with our safety team to look at uh, ways that we could um, uh, uh, safe, uh, provide that updated safety for our schools. One of the things that we learned in the uh, Rob Elementary School um, issue with uh, in Uvalde is uh, that it is good to have extra uh, or a backup system for your doors. Even though you had a locked door, that still was compromised. So one thing that won't be in, in the MBCOM report that we will bring forward to the board is the door sensors uh, uh, for um, all of our exterior doors. Um, the full capacity of that will kind of keep uh, 
uh, won't expose all of its uh, capabilities, but it'll let the uh, front office and the administration, the SRO on duty know if a door has been propped open and left unsecure, even though it's supposed to be locked, this is a secondary um, uh, protection that allows us to have that, uh, to, to, to have that. There also is screenings. Um, now screenings we, um, and, and you all saw firsthand with uh, Captain Ellis of uh, USC, um, Law Enforcement Division, uh, the open gate screenings for, for weapons detections and uh, using that um, uh, in the front offices so that any visitor, anyone who is not a student or staff identified uh, to be on that campus goes through additional screening. Um, we uh, would like to conduct those screenings according to our safety team and to our uh, FBI consultant through a vestibule. Um, vestibule. And uh, using that uh, allows us to even protect the, the front office staff uh, so that they're screened before entering into the building. And so in uh, our presentation, as we talk about providing equitable learning environments and, and safe and secure learning environments, um, we wanted to look at uh, amending the projects. Uh, initially, we had on there $4.7 million for a professional development room for the, the district office. So we would like to take that off. Why are you talking and so about the so. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so it, taking that off and uh, putting $5.1 million uh, to address, um, as you said, fencing, the vestibules, which was outlined in there. And uh, it is security systems, but it's gonna be for all of the schools. And uh, that's to cover, right now our footprint is um, about 1,345 exterior doors. So uh, with that, you can see here the project list uh, amended with uh, preliminary phasing, uh, pr preliminary pr prioritization. And that uh, uh, prelim prioritization of that list uh, just addresses some of the things that um, we think are, uh, are going to be uh, accomplished based on our funding. You'll hear on Monday uh, from our financial advisor, Jay Glover, of uh, if this passes, the intent of how to fund it through three series. Um, the first series would be in, uh, what is it, 2020, 20, 2023-24 of 50 million, followed by another uh, series of, of bond sales in 24-25, followed by the uh, third series of bond sales in 25-26. And so uh, you don't get all 150 at one time, but this will allow us to phase those in. Saying this to say that the number one item on there would be all of these security upgrades for all of our schools. Yeah. Ms. Gardner, do you have any? Ms. Huddle, on, on the security issue? No questions. Uh, I was, this is something that has, has intrigued me for a while, but when we started talking about the guaranteed energy savings contract that we have on Irmo High School, I think, and, and uh, Dutch Fork Elementary School, and I, I started looking like I looked at Chapin High School and the, the energy management systems that we have in the school district, you know, are not throughout. They're, they're building specific. And some of the newer buildings, of course, got things that older buildings don't. And some portions, newer portions of older buildings, of older projects have. Okay, so um, I was interested to find out, you know, since you have fire alarm systems and, and, and you have uh, security systems and you have energy management systems and all, all of those things together I was wondering is there a syst you know is there a systematic approach to tie all of those things together in the school system and bring it back to a central location in in this 
facility in, into a facility, a new facility, hopefully, you know, we could eventually get to it for this office. But those things, it seems like to me that we've got three different systems out there that work to different, differing degrees. It seems to me that, that if we went and brought energy management, since we're going to do this bond referendum, we brought energy management, security, and fire alarm together in one package, that we could bring all of those things back and, and similar to an item that we looked at, from, at at the University of South Carolina this summer or this spring or this, yeah, so this summer we looked at. Where, where central management could occur on certain systems, is there not a way that we could, we could district-wide bring all of our, 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 our technology, our smart systems together in one place? Here's why I'm asking. Okay, let's suppose we had, had uh, you know, a, a situation where, where, um, where, uh, I don't know what you would call it, but I guess um, where well, you'd need gas mask, you know, if you were, if you were a, a, um, a law enforcement person, okay? And uh, the air conditioning system's still going on in the building, okay? And so if you put that, if you put that, um, that agent into the air, it's gonna go through the whole air conditioning system and it's not gonna shut it off and it's gonna get into other rooms or other places where you've got people that couldn't breathe in there, okay? And your air conditioning system is gonna put this throughout the building, okay? Is there not a way that, that once you got a call from something like that, that you could turn off you know, the air conditioning systems or the heating systems so that when you went to make that, make that law enforcement approach at that particular, at the point of where you needed it, where it wouldn't affect everybody else in the building. Because I can, have, I can see you putting tear gas in a system and it goes all over the whole building, okay? We could control that if we had this system I'm talking about. And I'm sure, I'm sure if we're gonna bring all that back together, it wouldn't be that much more expensive to have a central control area. And I don't know where that would be. That would be where Mr. Wiseman is, I guess. But or maybe it'd be on his hip pocket. I don't know. But it, could we could we look into something like that, or is that too G whiz for us, sir? I I love the G whizzes. Uh, I'm 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 big on that. Right now we have a Phil and a cell phone that can do that from anywhere he's at, at least for the air conditioning systems, tying in the alarms and the fire systems. With the age of some of our systems, they may not be compatible. So if we if we look at something like that, you're literally may end up having to replace every smoke detector, fire alarm throughout any school so it's compatible with one system. It doesn't mean that there's not a workaround to somehow have a command and control of what my military term is, has always said is where we have designated location and individuals that have access to all three, maybe different monitors, that can push those buttons and activate as we need to. Um, but without going back and integrating or replacing everything, it's gonna be, in a sense, three separate systems at the most effective cost, but still doable. But you know, have one switch for fire alarms, one switch for smoke detectors, and one switch for HVAC. And, and it's doable, and literally now, this day and age, it's doable on a cell phone. We just gotta be making sure that we be respectful of understanding that some of those systems are pretty old. We might have to in, upgrade uh, some of the fire alarms to be capable of uh, tapping into a cell phone or wireless type system. But we have, right now, we have access to the people who can do that, but we don't have it all under one roof, if you will. So that's something that we can definitely look at. Yes, sir. Okay, um, that's as far as I'm gonna go with, with, with that subject, but I think you, you can read between the lines, okay. So um, the vestibules, you know, on the, the, how many schools was it that we, that we have? We had over eight of them, eight schools, I think, one, two, three, four, five, six. 
those those are also will also since they're your central point of entrance um, I don't know if you've ever been to to a bank where 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 you you know you go in one door but you can't go to the second door until the first one closes okay and what that does is an airlock okay and that saves you energy a tremendous amount of energy because the you know when you open a door in a in a like like it at Carolina Coliseum or Carolina or the Colonial Center, when you open a door, you remember how hard those were to open, but when they were open, here comes the air and it's gushing out of there. Well, I mean, you can imagine the cost of, you know, replacing that cool air or hot air. So it, we can do that, you know, with our main points of entry. In that regard, is that what we're talking about with vestibules? That's exactly what we're talking about is uh, some of our, and, and it's, how our buildings were built out over time um, when uh, these vestibules will allow us to uh, do that. It also allows screening. So before you get access to staff, uh, we have our schools pretty much set where you can't get access to students without being screened for weapons. But now it's about being uh, access to staff. We've identified 12 schools uh, since this, so that's what's budgeted in, in, in this project here. Uh, but that's exactly right. And then it has other uh, utilizations um, where we could uh, allow you into that first level, like you said, energy efficiency, screening, um, and, and uh, we can do that in a strategic way versus uh, piecemeal throughout the district. I have one other question about single points of entry. Um, when we, the board passed um, for us to have detectors um, just recently okay um, those will be manned by mr. Wiseman or dr. Ross security people and not by teachers or you know classroom teachers so so the plan is that eventually to be manned by staff uh, right now, we're going to do 30 days, the first 30 days of training. We don't want day one, anyone, uh, district employee, trying to learn how to use these. So in all of our schools, they'll be manned by uh, security personnel on the first 30 days to help with the transition. If it takes longer, then we'll, we'll, we'll do longer. But our schools and principals are currently working on that staffing plan. But the goal is it's not a classroom teacher doing duty working on that. Also, we're starting out uh, with just that one point of entry for visitors getting into the building. So it's not students that we're looking at screening. Um, it's, it's, it's not even uh, those who are coming in to drop off something. I want to drop off lunch for my child. It's anyone who's trying to get into that building, that's where that additional screening comes in. Uh, as we talked about it in our, uh, in our meetings, some of our buildings are set up where it's best to put it when you come in that first door. If it has a vestibule, they're going to go ahead and use it like that. Others that don't, we were not uh, on day one on the 16th set up that way. So it's if you are trying to get access into the building, you would be, you go through that additional screening. We also, just to note, I think it's, it's important to note uh, that on uh, first day in, in elementary school, it's a big day for um, parents to walk their kids to class and things of that nature. So um, we are, we're, those will be uh, uh, in use for parents, not for students. But uh, as parents come into the building to walk their children to class, they go through that. And that also would be manned by security personnel, not by, not by staff or students. And I wanted to touch on one other thing. Ms. Gardner, do you have anything to add to that, Ms. Ms. Huddle? Um, she's shaking her head no, I can see it. But um, we had, uh, some of the parents had uh, been concerned about security personnel. Um, they had, uh, but I want you to tell us what the plan is if if we do not have an SRO for a particular um, for a particular um, building, what our plan is going into the school year. So according to the state procurement uh, law, we are allowed.
allowed to uh, contract uh, with SRO services uh, to include security personnel. Uh, we have done that. We still have our contract and agreement with Lexington County Sheriff's Department. Uh, I think it's okay to say publicly we're down to, I think, four schools right now that are not covered. So that is, um, we're moving to full coverage. But for those four schools, we will have security personnel there. Um, the question is why have it at the elementary schools and not uh, use the SRO and use the SROs at secondary? And the reason being is based on our on our data of incidences, we have more student to student incidences on the high and middle school level, where you would need an SRO. Um, versus in the elementary, more of ours is as is, is non-students. It's pe keeping the perimeter safe from intruders versus student to student issues. So we would want uh, law enforcement, deputized law enforcement to deal with the high school issues that are dealing with student to student. Okay, very good. The next thing that I wanted to discuss was in my, in my travels around to this, I, I went to most of the schools in the district this last year um, it didn't quite make it all because of COVID. But anyway, the thing that I noticed, I think there's five of our facilities that have portables, still have portables. And I know we talked about the fact that portables are, um, are not, in our estimation, I think it was the, you know, they're not, they're not, you can't secure a portable like you could you know, a, a, a regular, um, you know, facility uh, with hard walls. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that we, you know, most portables, I guess, all of them have uh, plywood walls and, metal and, and wood stud construction and a floor, so to speak. So anyway, I, you know, just a wood, wood frame or basically what they are is mobile units that have, have a wood floor. Anyway, um, they have skirting around the outside, and it's, you know you could you could possibly you know things could happen under the under the thing that you couldn't have in in a regular building. So we've looked at that, and I believe um, you know we we want to make sure that the bond referendum is you know basically does away with anything that's not really secure. Can you address that? Uh, that's correct, and not only. Does it present issues uh, on security? Again, this is after a walk with um, a, a special agent from the FBI. We were just asking, give us tips on how we can, can secure these facilities. And uh, when you're hardening the outside of the building, uh, but you send the kids on the outside for portables, you're, you're really compromising your, um, your, your defense system. Uh, especially with um, uh, uh, those portables. And they also present an issue with uh, severe weather, uh, inclement weather. You, you, you can't be in those. And I understand, uh, I think these are temporary pieces. They, these are not, um, they should not be for part of your, your permanent um, uh, space. So yes, we have, uh, going on that, uh, that advice, that recommendation to bring students into the classroom, I think not only for the active shooter issue, but also for severe weather uh, issues, we, we get a maximization there. I think also if we look at cost per unit uh, to uh, put those on the ground, to uh, wire them up and to get them to the specs that uh, the Office of School Facilities expects with, with the fire alarms, the same security systems, the uh, fiber that we need to run out there, um, plumbing, th those costs could, could um, be between $90,000 and $100,000 per, per portable. So um, th those are exorbitant costs there. <laughs> Got some more than portable. Yeah. <laughs> so so here's, here's uh, a question, you know, the, that I thought of, but you've got Lake Murray Elementary School, and I don't believe it's on the bond referendum list. Okay, it has portables. Okay, are we going to make program changes, in, or or 
or are you going to modify the, the list? And, and so what we can do is uh, essentially, if I go through this presentation here, we've had the shifting of that population out west, as you said. Uh, the way we would handle the, uh, the portables at uh, Lake Murray Elementary is basically looking at the newest construction out in Chapin. And so essentially those wings are what we have at Piney Woods. So you're taking the entire Chapin attendance zone and you would redistribute those amongst those four schools to get everybody back in the building. If, uh, now we have two versions of how this would, would happen because of where the shift in the population is and where those schools are. And so what we are uh, looking at is, and, and we, have, uh, we, we hope to have um, this by our next board meeting. Uh, we just got in, so I haven't had a chance to review it. Uh, the demographers work, but our goal is to provide the community with two options. Option A shows if the referendum uh, does not move forward or fails, this is how far you will have to rezone to get everybody into an existing building. If it moves on, this is how we would have to rezone to get into an existing building. So my philosophy has always been use your existing square footage, uh, feel what you have before you build anything new. So I think the most convenient thing would be to look at all of the existing space in Chapin, and then set uh, our, our rezoning towards that. Uh, if there is no um, uh, referendum and that space is contracted, then we have to fill back to our empty spaces, and that can be as far, far back as uh, Lee Park. So those realities we will draw up very clear for the community so that they can, they can see those options there. So um, that bleeds over into, well, first of all, um, I, I understood from talking to you earlier that basically there was a program change at, at, one, of the, at one of the area high schools that you're considering. Right. Right. Would, would, how, how will that affect the, you, you know, the facilities or will it? So I um, uh, appreciate that. If you also see another change at Dutch Fork High School, uh, we are including an advanced robotics lab. Um, reason being when uh, Dutch Fork took on STEM, and I, I, I don't have the exact date, uh, but it was over a decade ago, um, the STEM programs throughout the state and, and the country um, they were not as uh, pronounced. That was very innovative at the time when, when they started that. may have been um, 20 years ago if I start, think, start thinking about it with uh, Ms. Helen Anderson bringing that on. Uh, so uh, now what we want to do is make sure that uh, we're able to keep that competitive edge, that competitive advantage that they have. Um, and the future in STEM is in robotics. They have an amazing robotics program there. I believe in R&D, uh, research and development, and we can, within the uh, amount, working with Mr. Priggy uh, and um, the Korean Technical Program, create an advanced, bio, uh, an advanced robotics lab uh, for those students. So uh, I think that is um, very important. So you'll see that addition. One of the things, uh, Mr. Chair, if you allow me to, to kind of explain why we want these lab spaces, and it's a, we've talked about threshold a lot. Um, we as practitioners like the 80% threshold uh, as being the threshold of the school, because in our target of having that, we intend to have 80% for learning how to know something. That's the lecture lab lecture hall, but we want 20% on learning how to do something. And I think a complete program is when students learn how to know, learn how to do, and learn how to be. And if they can do those three things, I think we have a complete and effective 
uh, program. We want to be very efficient with the resources that the community gives us, but we also want to be effective. And to be effective, having spaces where children can learn how to do, uh, especially in an environment where CTE is needed, hands-on is needed, those lab spaces are very important. In this very rudimentary uh, uh, model of a school, you, you see uh, 10 classrooms, um, whereas um, uh, eight of them are dedicated for the, your, your classroom teacher with their caseload, and then two open labs. So that will come up as an 80% utilization because we haven't put classroom teachers, if you take the number of classrooms divided by the number of students, you have two open spaces. But if our district makes a commitment to allowing that 80% utilization, then those two school, those two rooms can be used for learning to do. Allowing our schools, our, our students to have that competitive advantage of getting our students ready for the future. As you move to a 100% occupancy rate, you lose those lab spaces. You lose that place and everything becomes lecture or you're trying to do it within that same space. Labs evolve. Labs can be a robotics, then it can be uh, nanotechnology, but that R&D, investing in that R&D puts our schools uh, at, at not only competitive advantage, but a, a great, it increases the effectiveness of our educational program. And so, um, but the reality is that we get this um, situation where not every student is the, is the same, is weighted the same. And you see in our budget, we've changed the weights of students based on poverty, based on special education. And so programming a building becomes much different. Um, for instance, the board will set uh, let's say for kindergarten, we will, uh, we will have 21 to 1, or 21 to 2, you have to have two teachers in there, so no more than 21 students in that classroom. However, if it's a Title I, you gotta build that classroom at 18. If you have uh, an ED class, you're not gonna put 25 ED students in there, you know, you know, maybe put eight. Uh, so based on the types of students, so sometimes I think it could be very misleading to take the number of students, divide that by the number of classes, and um, think, well, this should be the utilization rate. You have to look at the individual needs, the individual weightings, and, 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 and that changes year to year. So what we end up seeing, especially at a, a Title I school, is because you don't, you, those, those schools will build at lower class sizes by law. And it will take more of the labs and turn them into lectures. And as a result, you have now four, I think, Title I elementary schools of our six that don't have science labs. So it's having that flexibility, building at 80% utilization gives us that flexibility so that we are efficient but effective. And I think that is when a child comes to school, they learn how to know, they learn how to do, and they learn how to be. And um, so I think it's important as we talk about utilization rates that we, we communicate to the public. It would be very misleading to say, well, what's your average class size? How many students do you have? Let me do division without using the weights of the students to determine classroom utilization rate. Okay, so the f I found that shocking that we, four of, I think one of our constituents brought that to our attention uh, earlier, to my attention, it was just like a month ago that, that four of our six elementary schools that were Title I didn't have a lab. I know I've been to, I think it's Dutch Fork Middle School where, where they use a a large open space over there um, for their lab. So are we, are we talking about just using the space that we already have differently and calling that a lab or are we talking about a, 
a space that's used for more than one function as a lab, because that's what Dutch Fort Middle School had. It was used for more than one function. In most cases, when you're going to high school, uh, a lab is going to, a bio lab is going to be a bio lab. A chemistry lab is going to be a chemistry lab. Um, without me getting into too much detail to mis be misleading, you have a lot more flexibility on elementary. Uh, you may just have the room availability, and you can make it a maker space. You can bring in uh, uh, science tables one year and make it a wet lab. So we have more flexibility that way. And according to this model, if we need to turn it from lab to lecture, you can do that as well. Maker space like they have at Lee Park Elementary School? Maker space that, like, like it, that? Okay. Exactly right. So, so but, but I guess my leading lead into this, I'm leading the witness, but the... Uh, <laughs> How do we address this? No, well, I mean, are we, are we putting things into the bond referendum for specific, you know, to specifically earmark certain spaces for, for science labs for those buildings that don't have it? Well. Because, I mean, you know, because, I mean, I, we don't, for equity purposes, we don't want somebody that came from one elementary school to, to look you know to look to a bachelor of science or a master of science degree in college and then somebody that came from another that would be truncated from that or you know because they didn't have the things that the age when people you know wet their you know their their need to need to know i mean we uh, I want to see for equity purposes that, that if we've got to put something in this referendum that that's where it needs to be, that we establish that. I mean, I, that's the way I believe. I don't know, I just, I think most of the members of the board would feel that same way. I think everyone would feel that same way. We feel that way as well. We have, uh, this has come up on us, I think at the community forum is where that principal um, made us very aware of just this scenario, and that's when we began to look at it. The bond takes care of two of the four. We would look at capital to take care of the other two. Okay. Um, so, but what we're talking about is a generalized space. We're not talking about a space that has lab gases and, you know, and things like we like you Bunsen burners and things like we had Amen. in chemistry in high Correct. school. That's not what we're talking Correct. about. Correct. And in the high school program, it gets very uh, you know, pronounced because we actually program the chemistry and bio labs. And you will see those uh, either connected or as a part of the lecture hall. Uh, when we talk about labs in these cases, um, this gives them the flexibility, whether it's an art or a um, science lab to do, you know, kind of wet labs. Uh, now you're seeing things with technology, and, and so it gives that as, as that, that principle. And we have a lot of themes through our magnet program where you can use that. Uh, at the high school, this is a great example. We have the space that we can use. It's just converting that. Um, uh, uh, for the circuitry to allow those students to do the programming for advanced robotics. Okay, um, we have about 15 minutes left, and we try to limit the meetings to an hour. So yes, sir. I'm sorry. Um, and uh, the next item, we've replaced. Um, I see. Have Ms. Huddle, have we addressed the, the um, substitute? Um, the next item on here is discussion of the bond question. Okay, we, we modified the agenda just a minute ago to because uh, the item that we had on here we didn't And we I would just like, like to say if we can put that item to be discussed at the August 22nd board meeting, we'll make a note for the um, officers meeting. Well, I think one of the items Ms. Huddle and I had talked about uh, on the telephone too um, before the meeting was the, uh, that demography study that you have. Um, now, the, when is that going to be given to the board? Because I think that's that's wasn't that key to the reasoning while while our scheduling and so forth of the 
the discussion. That is, I got it two minutes before this meeting starts, so I'll, I'll oh, forward yeah, it on to you. I mean, I'm, I'm yeah. not saying that. I just okay. what, what we're saying is that, that you know, if we're going to be called to, Amen. Yes, to discuss $150 million, <laughs> we want to know, you know, everything yes, there is to know. Correct. A few, correct. You know, correct. About yes, it sir. soon. Yes, sir. Sooner than later. But anyway, um, I'm sure you'll handle that, and I didn't mean to put you on the spot no, about it. That's not the point. But um, the uh, next item, uh, of course, is discussion of the bond question. And we, I know you gave us a handout here. Yes, sir. Um, Could so you describe that a little bit for Ms. Huddle? Because she's sitting there. You know, I've seen it. Oh, you have? Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, so when the amendment was made, what we did is just um, sent this out to the, the board. Uh, for your review. These are drafts. These Again, these are drafts. These are not the questions. This is for uh, discussion. So what you have uh, working uh, based on the motion that was made uh, at the board meeting to uh, work with our bond uh, attorney to come up with potential questions, potential questions. We have uh, three versions here uh, for the, the committee to look at. Um, again, None of these versions have to move forward, but these are, are for our discussion. Uh, in the first version, version one, uh, you see uh, a focus of, uh, I think all of the prefixes are the same, and I'll read the prefix uh, for those who do not have a copy. Um, and it's basically school district number five of Lexington County in Richland County, South Carolina bond referendum shall the Board of Trustees of School District Number 5 of Lexington County and Richland County, South Carolina, parentheses, the school district, be empowered to issue at one time or from time to time general obligation bonds of the school district in the principal amount not exceeding $150 million, the proceeds of which shall be used to finance the costs, including architectural, engineering, legal, and related fees of the following. In version one, we outline district-wide, and it has continuing security upgrades for all schools and facilities, renovating and equipping uh, the existing Dutch Fork uh, Elementary School to house alternative education programs. Um, this is uh, the alternative building in, uh, to Rosenwald Rich Lex. You have uh, items in uh, Chapin Attendance Zone, which is the Fine Arts Building at Chapin High School. It outlines the Dutch Fork Attendance Zone projects, the Sixth Grade Academy at Dutch Fork, Dutch Fork High School in the Advanced Robotics Lab, uh, the new Dutch Fork Elementary, um, and renovating uh, the Dutch Fork High Stadium. And then it outlines the items in Irmo, uh, the Irmo Middle School Sixth Grade Academy, the uh, Seven Oaks, improvements and uh, remodeling crossroads, nursery roads, Harbison and West, and the Irmo High School Stadium. So that's version one. Uh, <clears throat> version two takes the district wide out and you see the security for each one. So uh, not reading everything over again, but you just add security upgrades for all schools for Chapin Zone, Dutch Fork Zone, and Irmo Zone. In uh, version three, uh, it does not have it by zones. It just has all of the programs. Okay. So um, basically at the, uh, what we would basically present to the, to the board on, on Monday is uh, this version. Uh, it's a slightly different from what you've seen, but it conveys what these questions have. So in version one, uh, you have uh, where adult education is now with Irma High School to signify that they're in the same building. Uh, Piney Woods and Five are together to signify that they're in the same building. Uh, Spring Hill and the Academy for Success are together to signify they're in the same building and then you have the Center for Advanced Technical Studies. Um, that's uh, if, it does, if it fails. If it moves forward, then you would have this graphic. And this graphic shows Spring Hill High School by itself, 
It would show the early childhood center by itself at the Harbison campus. Uh, the, we're looking at the, looking for the old colors, if anybody knows the colors of the old Rich Lex building school. But the uh, Academy for Success, Adult Ed, and the five program would all be housed at that building. And then uh, the Center for Advanced Technical Studies would be housed uh, where it is. And you see Irmo would be by itself and Piney Woods would be by itself. So um, these are the um, uh, two options in front of the community once we all dive into uh, this data. Now, I would like to make note that according to the contract, we get revisions. So like we have draft on here, I think it's important that, um, that we consider this a draft and that um, the vendor's work is not called as, uh, because they, they have asked that we, we make revisions. So um, we want to make sure we work with the vision. Uh, once we get our feedback, allow them opportunity to make the revisions and then uh, release those as the options of the rezoning uh, in one of these, these different uh, layouts. So I think the, the, the biggest thing that we want to make sure in terms of the efficiency is that each plan has the same debt service tax rate. And so it's going to be, in my opinion, um, direct democracy to see what happens uh, to the future of our district. Ms. Huddle, do you have any comments? Yes, I have um, several. Uh, well, I have a question, and, and um, my first question is, um, I think that's the first time I've seen the robotics lab. And my question is why we would put that at one school as opposed to putting it at Kate? That's a, a great question. I, I think it's to, if you look at the, um, the choice programs and the magnet programs that we, we have and serve in the district, um, there is, uh, at Dutch Fork High School, there's STEM theme. And they've had STEM for, like I said, over 20 years. And I think not invest, this is an opportunity to invest and enhance their, their current program. It's almost like what's its 2.0 version and that's why that robotics lab is there. Um, it, the program is already there. We just wanted to give those, those students the, the space and the place to take it to the, to the next level to, to upgrade that. So it's not a new program it's just providing a advanced robotics lab for that existing program. Okay, um, and Mr. Levison, can I ask my, or can I go on with my other question? Let, let's okay, let, a let's let Ms. Gardner, she has a follow up to, to I can't to see your, you guys, so let, that's let's fine. Let, let's let Ms. Gardner, because she has a follow up to the, your robotics first question. question. Yeah. So um, I know the Kate Center has a robotics team and they do after school work, would it be possible for them to maybe use the Dutch Fork Lab if they wanted to, if it felt it was advanced and it would help their team, would they have access to it? Because I assume that the robotics lab would be used during school hours for robotics at Dutch Fork for their program, but maybe after school it would be available for the other schools to use? Correct. I think it, it is a district resource. Uh, what uh, because we have the existing program, it is co-curricular at Dutch Fork. It could certainly be extracurricular for anyone in the district. Ms. Huddle. Um, in looking at the, the question, um, well, first of all, I did have a, a, a suggestion and a question. I'll start with the suggestion. I think that the, there's some lack of specificity, which if I was a taxpayer would concern me. Um, you know, things like I think it, it just says um, on Seven Oaks, it just says site improvements. It doesn't really say what they are. And it doesn't lay out that, that the Chris building would actually be used for Harvest and West, for the students that go there. It just says as needed by the district. And those are just two examples. There's some other areas in there. So I just think it needs more specific specificity. Um, and then the other is a question, which we had talked about in the board meeting is, 
you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in the world right now as far as interest rates and inflation and all of that. Um, and I noticed the, I think the version three is kind of laid out in the same, I think it's the same order as your priority. And the question I have is, are we allowed to say that um, on the on the ballot? Or is it, are we allowed to say that these are in priority order? I think we, we're gonna, we're gonna have uh, Miss um, Franny Hauser there at the meeting. So I'll go ahead and prime her. We meet tomorrow at nine. I think that's a great question. We had committed in our language, but we want to make sure it's written out that the, um, the reason we prioritize the stadiums at the end, because um, version three should have duck fork higher, but the stadiums were going to be the last things that would be tackled because if um, that wouldn't happen, we, we have this $7.8 million buffer for, to hedge against any inflationary impacts and we would not do the stadiums. So I think you're right to be very clear that um, um, having that language in there that, you know, these are an issue of priority and funding. And while we did estimate, we did uh, include and re-estimate for inflation, we don't know. And so um, to know, uh, for the taxpayer to know that there's inflationary hedge against the, the, the stadiums, um, I think would be, you know, it's, it's washed by the light. Everybody sees it and knows it. Okay. Um, can I now, can I ask a question? Are we, are you guys got any more? Cause if you, okay. So one of the things that I, I read contracts and one of the things on, on this on all of them that I would put in there is that, that include, if, if you intend to purchase some land that that, be put in here, okay? Not just, this is not just construction cost, this is also property, I mean, you know, to purchase property. And all of those, and all of those costs that go along with it to do due diligence and whatever, okay. Second thing is, um, I had on my list was the same thing that Ms. Huddle said, was to make sure that we, I know Ms. Heiser said not to do this, but I don't agree. Um, I don't always agree with, you know, what, what they say, but I would like to see it where, where we would uh, enumerate what would come off if, and the only reason it would come off is because the money wasn't available. That the, cannot be all these, um, you know, subjective reasons why you would change this, because I think that that bills mistrust with the people. So I, I, I would like for it to say that it cannot be changed in the, unless, unless it, you know, the funds weren't available. And that means inflation, you know, you could even define that out. And that if you did change it, then it, uh, what it means is that the priorities at the bottom of the list would move up until you know, until that was exhausted, until you could build it all. I mean, I, I think that's what people want to hear. If you tell them $150 million and they expect to get a, uh, this happened before, they expected to have an elementary school and they didn't get it because the priorities were changed by somebody other than them. You said it was democracy, so we need to make sure if, we, if it's democracy, then, then they get what they bought, okay? And, and, and um, we don't need any changes and have it very well spelled out and clearly spelled out what happens if, if and the only reason <laughs> that you can change it would be the lack of funds. Do, you know, I, I see some head shaking. What do you think, Ms. Gardner? Yeah, I agree. I think it should be on the bond, the question, because I think many of our constituents, people that would be voting, or may not be aware of how we're doing things, so it needs to be very clear on the question. I did, I did too, and I, I think the more that we can say those kinds of things, you know, the, the clearer it would be. People are going to have a real choice to make, and, and they can see it, and they can see it. You know, the biggest thing that, that I think that this board needs to project to everybody is that we have a plan. Okay, it's obvious. It's more than obvious that if we don't do something, you know, the world's changing around us, and we cannot 
continue the way we are for very much longer. Okay, I think that's the, that the voters of the community want to know what what is your plan, right or wrong, indecent, whatever. They they get a choice to make to say, I don't like what they're doing. That's fine, but we have to produce a plan to show them, and and you know they'll get the choice and and. Uh, if if it passes, you know, if it passes the board, we'll, we'll we'll give them a clear choice. But I want it to be succinct, clear, out there. You know, this is this is this is what we believe in would be the best method to approach this. And if not, I guess this will lead into your to your last subject. <laughs> okay, which is what happens if it you know if if e a the board doesn't vote for it or b that that the public doesn't accept it correct so if um if the if it doesn't move forward then uh we develop our our plan and our and our plan is getting every student back into a building um uh, addressing the uh, we, we still have to address the growth in shaping and you can't drive through Chapin right now and not see that that's not going to continue. And so uh, we're responding now. We're not ahead of this uh, at all. So we, how far we shift back, there's empty space. And with the referendum, I'm trying to keep Chapin and Chapin. Uh, without it, we have to go back to all of our empty space, and our empty space is in uh, River Springs, it's in, it's in Leap Heart, in Oak Point. So we have to, um, it will be an impact to the district. We are developing that, uh, we're using the work of the demographer. I recommend another one of these meetings where we can um, just kind of meet and ask questions uh, so that we can put those plans out. Um, but. Uh, this will be very clear that you know we don't stay as we are because we can't the the growth is here the growth is going to continue um and we have to have uh um, we, we have to be effective well having said that i think too the uh, miss gardner i just had a comment but do you is it okay go ahead i was just wondering if if it's possible to put um, something somehow worded on here that if we if this passes, you know that we are keeping our core, you know areas together. And if it, like, how do we put in here that? Because right now it looks like all Chapin is getting from this is a fine arts building. But in truth, it's they're keeping their they're keeping. They're staying in Chapin. They're staying in Chapin. Yeah, so how do yeah. we, is there a way for us to put that in here I, or is it just impossible? I, uh, I really appreciate it. When we talked about that, we had a very same question in our, in our meeting and I would like Ms. Ms. Uh, how to address it to the board so it comes from the attorney. My understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that we have to use that in our informational um, materials that the question of the bond is limited to the actual work of the funding of the sale of the bonds. That's my interpretation, but I would like for her to answer it because we asked that exact same question, even to the verbiage of where right now when we started this, I remember uh, uh, we, were, we were doing our, our um, you know, what's our master plan for buildings? this moved into how do we address growth now so we're we're talking about growth and buildings with this with this foundational plan and that that was our our key um uh, our, our our we're talking about those those key definitions so i think it's important uh that we definitely in our in our literature um in our informational literature signify that not only is this a fine arts building, but this is keeping the shape and attendance zone um, with the exception of Ballantyne because we would be moving that over, but that keeps shaping and shaping. We have to move further back with, and the magnitude of the move is what I would ask that we have some more time to look at 
um, as we dive into this. I'd also like for you, if you're going to do do that, you know, in our in our literature, you know, it's very important that that we address the fact with the Dutch Fork area. If we have a, additional space there, that that we're we're doing this to attract, you know, uh, better the best first time home buyer that we can, and we're offering things in in that arena that will help that um, will help us get you know our our growth to be more in that area and and ob it's pretty obvious with all of the projects we've got down here for Irmo that we were, we're trying to keep the nature of Irmo um, somewhat uh, you know to, similar to what it is now but we're also trying to give that community a boost so that it gets it gets uh, the best First time home buyers in its area, so that you know that we make it obvious to each of our clusters. We're going to have a fourth cluster, it looks like, with eventually with Spring Hill, that um, that what we're trying to do is is enhance what is already there, so that that people will will want to be in those areas also, and and not just you know. A, mass exodus to the west that's not what we want we want everybody you know we want the, the each one of our clusters has its own flavor and we want those flavors to be enhanced and and i think if we can you know get that point in there that maybe you know that maybe that that will help us along the way i agree i agree and i think you know our principles uh operations uh, the teachers, uh, I think they're very aware of what these projects bring uh, and to their schools. And uh, so I think on that notion of establishing what our expectation is, um, I feel a very complete education that I want my children in is that we, kids are learning three things, what to know, what to do, and what to be. And if we have the space and place and environment, I think great teachers are gonna to wanna to continue to work in spaces where they, they can teach all three. And having that equity, like you said, across the board, addressing things like science labs, the Title Ones, and uh, security features at all, uh, really puts that investment across. I, I would like to say though, I think what's also important is that um, as, as, as big as the scope is, this is a very big scope, uh, I think we are competitively priced compared to, I think, what other scopes are. And $150 million is not a small amount of money. It's not. But in terms of what we're going to, to do with that, uh, I, I think we are, we're saying to the taxpayer that we're doing this very efficiently and effectively. Uh, if you see how the series are done, it's going to be $50 million each year. We've already done that with Irmo High School. So it's essentially doing that using our existing tax debt capacity, I mean our tax uh, rate on debt service to service these so that we can pay these out over three years of each of each series. So I, I, I think um, if we go back to our initial questions, living within our means and delivering this value uh, I think that's a, a really solid plan, win-win for, for everyone. Um, so uh, now at the point of vote, I can't advocate for any, <laughs> any position, so it'll only be informational if it passes this, if it fails that. But um, in, in terms of, I just wanted to put that out there because we're on this side of a vote uh, to say that I think it's important to note um, what I'm seeing from other school districts and um, to, to do this within our existing capacity, I think is really good. Okay. So we're short time in here, so um, I'll move on to, unless there's something else. Do you have anything else, Ms. Huddle? Ms. Gardner? Um, move on to item six, and that was discussion of topics for the next meeting, and I know uh, the one that I have written down is the uh, Irmo High, High School East Wing cost analysis. Um, I know that we didn't get to have that today, which we anticipated. So I know that's on there. Do you have, does anybody have any 
Any other, Ms. Huddle? Um, I've asked for this before, and um, I would really like us, and it kind of goes back to what um, Dr. Ross was talking about before with program capacity versus, um, you know, classrooms and that, you know, not every classroom has 25 students in it kind of thing. I would really like to see, um, and I'm sure somebody's maintaining this, um, at, at a school level, and maybe this is just something that could be emailed to the board in advance of a meeting, but I'd like to see how we're using our capacity by school. Um, and maybe that's, you know, maybe we just start with an example of Lake Murray Elementary because we do have the, um, the portables. Um, it's just, I'd like to see that, you know, so that we have a better grasp on that, you know, in, instead of necessarily shifting lines. I realize we may have to shift lines, but to me, that should be a last resort. Um, the first goal ought to be to make use of that space. I mean, I've, I've been in business for years and companies that started running out of space. And before you start buying new space or renting new space, the first thing you do is figure out how you can better use your existing space. So I'd really like to see that. And, um, kind of in concert with that because these two things go together and we don't talk about them enough. And that is um, which children are attending these schools. In other words, again, well, let's just use Lake Murray for an example. There are children who are zoned for Lake Murray. There are children um, that might be a bad example in this of choice because it hasn't been a choice school for decades, but you know, it, it, how many children at each school are there because they're zoned there? How many are there through regular choice? How many are there because um, their parents work for the district? And I believe there's even intra-district. Like I believe there's a process where children that live um, actually outside of our district are able to go to school in our district. So we'd really like to see that by school. Okay, I was making notes. Um... Yeah, that had crossed my mind too when when we talked about the doing you know the portables, and the other thing when you said that we have um, you know six Title One elementary schools, that means that that we cannot, as you so aptly pointed out, we cannot just divide the square footage by the by the number of students and come out with some simplistic formula because it takes more in certain areas, more square footage, you know, in certain areas. So, um, and I think. Well, and I know that these, yeah. I know that, that this exists, or at least I've seen it in some schools, because when I've gone for my visits, sometimes I've been handed, um, you know, what amounts to a, a grid, right? Here's the classrooms and here's what's in them. And you can look at that and see, oh, there's no one in these classrooms these time. And I'm not saying they're not being used for something other than a class, but I'm talking something like that, where you can see how these classrooms are actually being used. Okay. Does that give you enough? Uh, Does that give you enough, Mr. Wyler? <laughs> <laughs> and what's that timeline? Just well, maybe just see that delegation. <laughs> Where's Van? Uh, just start with one, okay? If we can start with elementary, I think that'll be easier. Right. I, I mean, we're going to, regardless of which direction this goes, we're going to get asked a lot of questions. Amen. Well, why are we out of space here? Well, you know, I, why are kids in portables, but you're not addressing Lake Murray Elementary? I mean, we're going to get asked a lot of questions. And I think that, that the better we're informed, um, the better we can support um, the district. Amen. Yeah, Ms. Gardner. Oh, well. All right, something else that might be helpful, and this might only take two sentences. So you might be able to answer this right here, but for future topics, I know we've kind of gone away from talking about the district office, but I did, I am not sure what we decided to do, what we are doing, which direction we're moving in, because we're taking things off of the bond referendum, and we talked about the mold problem, so I just would like to update on that. So. But like I said, I don't know if that's an easy thing to answer. If we should talk about that at the next right meeting. now, yeah, it's a it's a it's a sore subject. We we have 
put it on the back burner again, not to move forward with it in the bond. Um, we're going to wait till our CFO gets here and uh, look at what we had in. Um, we had a plan with 16 million. Uh, that, uh, of course, now is, is highly compromised with inflation, with taking it out of the bond. So um, that's not prioritized right now. But uh, we'll want to, uh, not saying that that's, she's going to be able to fix everything, but I just want to confirm with her or where we stand on this. So um, with your with her, she's going to start the 15th? She starts Monday, Monday. As our at the board meeting, so that'll be her. <laughs> so, I mean, just to give give us kind of a timeline for those, for items three and four that we mentioned, well, two, three, and four, the program capacity, and then which children, and then the district office. Okay, could we look forward to having that? Uh, yeah, we can have an update on, on that, yes. I, I think if we work on the maps by elementary and, and utilization rates, uh, we can get that and at least give you an update as we do that, work on the zoning, and then um, uh, the, the finance plan for uh, where we were on the district. Um, we did have conversations, and we'll meet tomorrow at 9, about what to do with bond premiums. Um, and I think that's just something that needs to be open and um, have have the board uh, discuss about that because you do get money from that. And if that's prioritized um, uh, uh, in this, like uh, with the stadiums, then that's that's a discussion that uh, you know we would like to, to to have. But you do have bond premiums, so that's revenue that I think the public should be aware about that, that and the, the board have a, a plan for. And uh, if we say that um, with the existing funds that we would allocate for the district office and bond premiums, if we managed everything well, uh, could that go to the, the district office? And that would be our incentive to make sure we get this thing under budget. Uh, mold is not anything to play around with, and, and so we, we, we do need to be aggressive on, on a plan for that, but uh, the safety and security of those students and those, and those buildings are, are number one. So uh, we'll uh, confer with our, our new CFO. We welcome her on Monday when she comes. We will be talking with her tomorrow and uh, trying to pull together that plan as well. So we'll have that ready for the next facilities meeting. Okay, having said all that, do I hear um, a motion to adjourn? Ms. Gardner. I'll move that we adjourn. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, second by Ms. Gardner. All in favor? Aye. Uh,